A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. We are recording this on October 6, 2020. I'm Anna Garcia, your host. And our guest this week is criminal defense attorney Danielle Iredale, who's also a former public defender. Welcome back. We're so happy to have you, Danielle. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be back. So it looks like you're really back in the courtroom, meaning you are physically back in the courtroom. What's that experience been like for you? It's been really different. We're all wearing masks, trying to stay a bit distant. The Southern District of California, where I practice, has already done several trials. And what I'm looking forward to finding out is how we're going to be able to connect with jurors because we're going to have to wear shields and masks. The jurors will be wearing masks. And when you talk to someone, you can't help but, but look at them, right, for their idea. Are, are you feeling what I'm saying? Do you disagree? And we're, we're going to have that gone. And I'm glad to be back because for our clients that have been waiting, their cases will at least get to proceed. But of course, it's scary. And I think about everyone who is immunocompromised and to the incarcerated folks who you know, can't socially distance. So we are in a very different time. I think courts are doing the best they can to figure out how we're going to move through this. About two months ago, I went to a hearing here in Riverside County. So it was a hearing. There was no jury. And uh, because I was media, I was seated in, you know, you have to sit where you're told, plus everything is spaced out. I had a mask. I had a face shield. But um, the the sheriff's deputy put me right behind where they bring the defendant in. So the defendant sits down. Then there's like the wood, right, that separates where the public s- sits and then me. And I'm freaking out because I am two feet from the defendants with, you know, and they don't, they have a mask, but, you know, that is not socially distancing. And we all know that in the jail population, it's, it's very difficult to keep um, the situation as healthy as possible. So I was just, I could not have been more freaked out. Absolutely. It's, It's a lot. That's my client base. That's who I'm thinking about, who maybe can't stay safe, who's older. And we can just hope that they're going to make it through this. And that by getting cases on, we're at least resolving cases and people can resolve their cases and be out of custody and and lower the numbers, you know, lower the population. And I do believe that we can't have any more delays because these trials, these hearings have all been delayed. So many of them for months. Some of them have been done via Zoom. But you got to you got to move forward. You you can't keep everyone. This includes also the victims and their families. Right. We need to get justice. I, I think that's right. I think that's right. And the saying goes, justice delayed is justice denied. And absolutely for for both sides, for everyone waiting for victims, for accused we can't have a backlog like this because it's going to be impossible to dig our way out of it. Right. Okay. We've got two cases for you this week. Um, There's, if there's a common thread, it's that the person who was dating, if you will, the, the date was actually killed or the boyfriend or the girlfriend. Okay. That that's the common theme theme here. So there is, New DNA evidence in the gruesome murder of Sidney Loof out of Nebraska. But first, a West Virginia woman plotted with her father to kill her boyfriend so then she could marry her father. Okay? The whole thing is as screwy as possible. It is really frightening when you consider the le- the level of incest and what was going on inside this family unit, and clearly, man, I don't even know how to explain how I feel about about the woman who killed her boyfriend, but is also the victim of her father's disgusting sickness. It, um, 
when I read these cases, knowing that we were going to talk about them, I had to read over every line twice because it's beyond. It really is beyond anything that we hear about in daily life, right? When you have a criminal defense attorney on on these shows, we're, we're talking about the 0.0001% of cases. At least we hope, right? This is right. beyond what you can imagine. And like you said, this is someone accused of first degree murder who also is a subject of abuse, of incest by her biological father. So there's so many, it's a lot. It's a lot. It, it really is a lot. So this West Virginia woman hatched this plot with her dad, and it was to kill her boyfriend to pave the way so she could marry her father. She's now been sentenced, but obviously she didn't need to kill the boyfriend to have a relationship with her father if that's what she truly desired. That is a crappy defense and motivation. But the whole thing is is messed up. And and I also, I, I have to think that they were all on some serious drugs at the time because of what was done to the victim. And we're going to get to that in a second. So this murder, Danielle, was committed on Valentine's Day. And what adds to the weirdness, it's not just the daughter and her father, but also her sister. So it's two sisters and their dad all charged with killing the boyfriend of one of these women, okay? It's, I keep saying it's screwed up, but it really is. 31-year-old Amanda McClure has now been sentenced to 40 years in prison after she pleaded guilty to killing her boyfriend in 2019. Amanda was helped in committing this murder by her 55-year-old biological father, who is apparently not the man who raised her, Larry Mm -hmm. McClure. And then she marries Larry. Now, the father, the father is a registered sex offender who has spent a considerable amount of time in prison for his sexual offenses. The boyfriend, the victim here, the person who has been murdered, 38-year-old John Thomas McGuire was killed on February 14th of 2019, Valentine's Day. Amanda and John began dating when the two of them lived in Minnesota. So let's get to how they all got together in one home and how the murder was committed. Because if one part doesn't disgust you, the other one will. Okay. According to reports, Larry, that's the dad, Larry McClure, drove to Indiana with Amanda's sister, Anna, And they went to pick up Amanda and her boyfriend, okay? So father and daughter drive to pick up the couple. So we have that, okay? And they all go back to West Virginia. And they apparently live together for 10 days. The dad, the two daughters, and the soon-to-be murder victim. And in those 10 days is where apparently the murder plot was hatched. And in addition to that, apparently the murder was carried out over several days. This man was tortured. He wasn't just killed. He was tortured. Oh, boy. So, here's here's another reason why this is so sick. Larry, the dad, had just been released from prison for his sex crimes. So. Where do I start? Right? I want to know also if the sisters grew up together. Because it's an interesting thing. They're very close in age, and we know that they're now reuniting with the dad. I also wonder when we, they, they say that the plot hatched when the four of them are living together, but whose idea was that, right? And why were they all coming together in the first place? Right. And you have a, a father here who is, you know, without, without any question, a violent sexual perpetrator who is now placed in proximity with two women who we believe he has not only assaulted, but also as a result of this, there's been a incestuous relationship, which I, I, I don't, can we even say that, that she consented? She was an adult at this point. 
That's Oof, right. A, you're taking a deep breath because I don't a, even it's know. It's a difficult. Uh, it's a difficult question uh, in terms of age of majority. I don't know what the age in this state would be, but certainly she's over 18, uh, which is the, you know the age everywhere, and the psychological. I think what you're addressing, which is something that we all think about, is what kind of psychological power did this person have over her? And right. And apparently some of the motivation or what may have changed things is the father, who already is without question sick, the father is now feeling competition from the boyfriend. And so I think that that is the subplot of what was going on with the four of them. They should have never been together. And who knows what the boyfriend knew about the dad's past or he may have. Who knows? But, but that is fueling the father's rage, right? And then you've got the, the, the daughter, Amanda, who's trying to maybe move forward with her life because she has a boyfriend, but now her abusive you know, dad is back. I don't know. Let, let's, let's talk about some of the things that happened in the house because there's some things that we may never completely understand about this. So the actual... It was about a week into this that Larry and his daughters, right? Larry and his daughters came up with the plan to kill the boyfriend. So that means something happened and something turned and Larry doesn't like the boyfriend and wants him gone. And apparently the girls went along with it. So the torturing began on Thursday, February 14th, which would have been Valentine's Day. And he didn't die until a few days later. And Larry himself has said that it was two or three days of hell. I don't doubt it. I don't even doubt it. It's so sadistic. It's so sick. So this is what they did to Thomas, the victim. So they, they tied him up. They hit him in the head with a wine bottle. Then they injected him with massive amounts of meth. And then they strangled him. And that's why I think if they were all in the house doing meth, you're not going to tell me the meth just showed up, right? And it's West Virginia, and you've got a guy who's just out of prison. So my guess is everybody was freaking out of their minds. I, I'd bet money on that. I, I think it's very clear that this is drug-fueled. Um, it's not a defense, Right. No. It's not uh, voluntary intoxication wouldn't be a defense to a crime like this. But I think undoubtedly methamphetamine is involved in a lot of violent cases. And here, who knows what internal proclivities these people had. Right. Because, of course, murder is a terrible crime. But when you take this extra step to the torture, that's beyond Right. That's beyond that's something that I, I think very few rational humans can understand, can comprehend, or could even make their bodies do that. Right. Could even send the signal. It's it's beyond. Plus, if this really did happen over several days, which appears to be true, at any given point, any one of them could have stopped it. And they didn't. So that's a that's a very interesting point. And I think that makes for an aggravating factor. Certainly that's something the prosecution would be bringing up here is the the way in which the murder happened. So in in places with the death penalty, oftentimes there needs to be, for example, in California, a special circumstance. So not simply a murder, but something that makes it especially depraved, especially awful. So torture like this, this extended period, certainly I think would qualify to make this a death penalty eligible case, which is also interesting to me for such a serious case. This happened in 2019. Very interesting that the daughter has already pled guilty and been sentenced. Certainly she was offered an incentive, right? At 40 years, people can disagree, right? So my husband and I disagree all the time about what is a reasonable punishment. Because that's something, there are philosophies and we can talk about that, but that's really a gut feeling. Uh, But I think everyone would agree that for the crime to which she pled guilty, 40 years is absolutely an incentive, right? To be offered 40 years, there's no death penalty on the table. 
and there's not even life without parole on the table. She has what we call a determinant term. So after 40 years, she's released. She doesn't even have to go in front of parole in most places. So this was a case where she moved extremely quickly. And I wonder if she will be uh, testifying against the sister or the father. Well, let's continue with what happened allegedly that day and who has pled what so far, because there are a lot of moving parts here. So basically the father and the daughter, you know, those two already, their fates have been decided. And the other daughter, Anna, she's awaiting trial. So that's what's going to be very interesting is what is she going to do? So as we said, they pumped him up with methamphetamines and they strangled him to dead. They put a black garbage bag, they wrapped it around his head, and apparently Amanda, the girlfriend, right, is the one who did that. Anna, the sister, supposedly strangled him and the father held him down. This is all according to what the father says, okay? The good, ah. It's a good clarification, right? It's an interesting to think about who says what. Yes, and I don't know who to believe. Frankly, I don't believe any one of them. So then, now that he's dead, they decide to bury him in a shallow grave behind the house. People, how many times? It's the same crime over and over again. You bury the bodies in the backyard, of course it's going to be found. And husbands and wives who are trying to divorce kill each other. Again, the most obvious Obvious things that people do over and over and over again. Anyway, they go ahead and they bury him in the backyard. But then, six days later, they decide to dig up Thomas, chop him up, right? And then they stabbed him. He's been dead for days now. And they, they, they stabbed him with stakes. And then they buried him again. So if, if it wasn't enough for you already, right, at the burial, they do this extra step six days later. Now, I, as, as a defense attorney, if I'm looking at this case, one thing that I, that I do see is mental illness. At, at that point, the, the digging up later. Now, certainly it might not be enough and, and it doesn't seem like anyone's proceeding uh, by way of not guilty by reason of insanity or whatever the relevant statute would be there. Is it mitigating? I I don't know. I'd venture to say probably not because it's so violent. But there are some some situations where we see things happen. And at least my first thought is this is mental illness because no one in their right mind would why did they do that? I don't I don't get it. I don't know. I and it and it doesn't end, right? Because he's dead and buried in the backyard, which is horrendous, right? A person's life has been lost. But then But then the father, Larry, and Amanda, who is the the girlfriend of the man who's buried in the backyard, they decide they're going to get married, married. So they get a marriage license. They, They give a false name for Larry. They go ahead, the father and the daughter go ahead and they go to a church and they get married. I want to be very clear here. This is illegal in in West Virginia for a daughter to marry her father, okay? This is against the law. Not that it matters because murder is against the law. Clearly, they missed that one as well. Man, so they were married on March 11th, okay? Almost a month, month. right? a month after. Oh, God, I'm just so disgusted by this. Right. Okay. So they get married. And then on September 24th of 2019, this is about seven months after the murder, the shallow grave is discovered. Okay. How is the body discovered? This part to me is a little bit fuzzy, but I find very fascinating. Apparently the father had been pulled in on a violation for his um, failure to register, which- Catches up with a lot of people. 
And I don't know if he felt trapped or why he started talking or if they if the authorities already knew that John was missing and hadn't been seen in seven months. And and his family presumably, you know, had already contacted authorities. So it's hard to figure out the dynamics of what happened in this room. But apparently the father told the authorities while he's being questioned on his sex registration offenses, he confesses to an incestuous relationship with his daughter, and then also to this. I think that um, it only took you one and a half episodes to make me speechless, and it (laughs) it happened. It worked. Um, Look, (sighs) uh, wow. And of course, I always tell my clients, exercise your right to remain silent. This seemed like a situation where they were acting in such a brazen way, right? He goes somewhere, he marries his daughter, that this was going to catch up with them, certainly. And, you know, this this man who was killed, it, it looks like he had children. And for his family's sake, absolutely better. We know what happened sooner rather than later. I don't know why, but people always consent and people always make statements. I just like they always bury the body in the shallow grave. I don't know why. Those right. are the right, right behind on your on your property. How else could it have gotten there? So right after this, Amanda and Anna, so the two sisters are arrested and they're charged with um concealment of a deceased body while Larry was arrested on his failing to register as a sex offender. So at least they get everybody off the streets right away while they try and figure out what in the world they have in their hands, on their hands, who's dead, is that really Thomas? So, mm-hmm. so the process can continue. Eventually, Larry pleads guilty to first-degree murder, and he is sentenced to life in prison. This happened in August. Um, Anna is facing a first-degree murder charge. She's waiting for her trial, and as we said, Amanda, who would have been the girlfriend, the one who married her father, pleaded guilty to second degree back in July. Okay, so a few things have come out that are in the public record now about motivation, about what was going on, who said what. So let's fill in the gaps with that now that we all know that the three of them are tucked away in in jails as they should and some in prisons. So Amanda entered her plea before her father was sentenced, which I find interesting. She probably saw the writing on the wall, said, hell, let me take this 40 years I don't want to deal with a trial. And he also did not go for for a trial. He actually confessed everything in this handwritten letter, letter. And that to me is fascinating because this is a man who clearly has no regard for human life, clearly, no, and no regard for the safety of his daughters. But he was worried that the cost of a trial would just be too much for taxpayers. According to the Bluefield Daily Telegraph newspaper, the father wrote in this letter, quote, I just want it over. No trial, no taxpayers money spent for a trial. I plead guilty, no contest. Thank you for your time on this matter. How crazy is that? I have represented thousands of people and I've never had a client Mention the cost to the taxpayer. Certainly, I've I've used that in negotiations to try to resolve something. Um, it, it's so odd. You can't make this stuff up, right? If we saw this in a movie, we'd say that was a silly plot line. That would never happen. And then it did. I I also do want to just give a tiny caveat about mental illness, and and I do want to say that so many of us live with mental illness and live productive, meaningful lives, and I certainly um, do address it. When I have clients with mental illness, I address it with the court. But I don't at all um, mean to suggest that someone with mental illness has a tendency towards violence. Uh, It's just that those actions, and in this case, it seems like there's something more going on with these people. Yeah. In fact, in this letter, the father says that it was Amanda, the daughter he married, who was the ringleader But he went on to say that he really didn't understand what the motivation was other than he he other than he thought that she wanted. Thomas's social security checks, so the social security checks of the murder victim, which apparently she did cash, as we find out later. 
which we, we, we see that. But I have to tell you, sometimes random things will bother people, right? To me, that really gets me. How dare you, this father, how dare you point the finger at your daughter as the ringleader? I just think there's no, there's no loyalty in that. There's no, you want to come forward and you want to accept responsibility. Fine, do it for yourself. But don't point your finger at your daughter who you've obviously manipulated so much so that she agreed to marry you, right? I, I don't know why that's the thing that really, that really got me. Oh, he's a disgusting pig, you know, and it doesn't end, right? Yeah. And it doesn't end and it's not going to end. And, and I don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't think this guy's ever going to change. That's, he is, he is the creepy horrible person that he is. I don't believe in redemption for this one. And I do believe in redemption, but not for Larry. You you know me, Anna. You know I, I am a believer in redemption until the end, but I will admit that I don't want to be in an elevator ever with that man. Um, and I, I'm so sorry to, to the victim in this case, but I have to, I have to still believe in redemption. And for him, it will be redemption in prison as he's sentenced. We'll have to disagree there. I, I respect your opinion, and I, I, I'm just going to be respectfully disagreeing. To be clear, he has to earn it. I, it's not something to which he's entitled. Mm, I still will respectfully <laughs> disagree with you. If I was I there, understand. I'd shake your hand, and we could... <laughs> absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah. A- absolutely. A- and, you know, that's part of your motivation as to what you do, right? Um, and I respect you for it. So... He, Larry also includes that he's sorry for his role in the murder. Okay. So it's an interesting confession. Sorry for my role. I only, it wasn't my fault, judge. But nonetheless, we're glad he pleaded. He's out. He's, I mean, he's, he's gone. At Amanda's sentencing hearing, the victim's mother, so the victim being John Thomas McGuire, his mother, Karen, managed to address the court about her feelings, about her being a victim in all of this, of course. And she did it via Skype. And she said that she knew that Amanda had taken her son's social security checks and other checks and cashed them after he died because she knew something was wrong. Her son was missing, obviously, but checks are being cashed. And then the mother said that the grandchildren are absolutely terrified that Amanda will one day get out of prison and then come after them like she did to the dad. And then the mother also suggested that Amanda killed her son, John, because her dad was jealous. That to me sounds like the most believable motivation in this entire thing. That the father was jealous and he's putting pressure on Amanda. Amanda had apparently in this, you know, trip that they all took and they were together in this home, Amanda had told her father that she was in love with John Thomas McGuire, right? She professes her love that the relationship is going well and her screwed up father doesn't like this and is jealous. That to me makes sense. And then toss in the methamphetamine. I think that's right. And this also touches on two parent-child relationships, right? This poor mother who loses her child. And that's something that for a parent to have to go through that, it's the most heartbreaking. And then this father who wasn't there for his daughter, was away for all of her life. And rather than see her and do what you'd hope a father would do, which is, I'm so glad you're happy, start or participate in this truly macabre torture scheme that has now ended, what, four lives, right? Mm -hmm. And Amanda said during this hearing, she said that her father didn't want anyone else near her. And that's probably one of the few things that is truthful in this entire story. I actually, I believe that. So... She went on, you know, uh, Amanda's telling her side of the story here at sentencing, not like it's going to reduce anything, but she told the court 
that um, John was killed pretty much right after telling her dad that she was in love with him and wanted to marry him. Okay, so you're hearing it from both, you know, the future mother-in-law and you're hearing it from the killer herself. The judge said that Amanda was attempting to place blame for John's death on her father. Okay, I get that. You're right. They all need to be held accountable here and you can't be, you know, pushing it off on, oh, well, dad was jealous. You know, that's not a reason to kill anybody. The judge went on to say, quote, I don't think that you're taking full responsibility for killing John. You're blaming it on your father. After killing John, you dug him up later. And when you all dug up his body and then dismembered him, you know, he goes on to say, then you reburied him. There was no reason for this. It, it was almost as if the judge is trying to say that there was a further infliction of pain and disrespect on the victim. I mean, I know he's dead already, but but that's, it's like not, and I wonder, I mean, was it the father's idea to dig him up and let's all stab him again because I'm still mad? That's that's what I wonder too. And what you said is right. It It does matter. We have laws that criminalize desecrating a corpse because there is something to it. While maybe the person can't feel pain, there is something, it, it is wrong. It is absolutely wrong. And just a little bit of background on Amanda and her sister, because this whole thing is so confusing. So Amanda was not raised by Larry, this guy, her biological father. Um, they were estranged. She was raised by adoptive parents. Amanda has a 32-page long criminal history, mostly involving drug crimes. So that would paint a picture that Amanda has not been of clear mind for a long time, okay? And getting back to how much of a role the drugs may have played into this. Larry was convicted on July 22nd of 1998. We're going back for first degree sexual assault for abusing a family member between the ages of six and 12. This is according to the West Virginia Sex Offender Registry. And of course, you never reveal the name of um that's what i wonder right could it have been one of the children or anna could it have been one of the sisters i think absolutely logically yes um he served 17 and a half years in prison and of course they never identified who the victim was but amanda and anna would have been within that age range i think they would have been nine and ten yeah Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Which explains why they were not raised by him. And what's unclear is where's the mother? I, I don't know. But what a horrible and sad and sick family. And what an ending. What an ending for them all. Now we're moving on to Nebraska for our next case. This is where new DNA evidence has been revealed in the gruesome murder of Sidney Loof. This is the young woman who disappeared after going on a date with someone that she met online. Sydney Loof went missing on November 16th of 2017 after setting up a second date with someone named Bailey Boswell, whom she met on Tinder. Now the family said that Sydney had been depressed. She was unhappy with her job at a local grocery store, and she was also broke. So that sets up a picture of what's going on in Sydney's life, which is important if you look at being taken advantage of, right? Someone who's vulnerable, which Absolutely. I think is very, very important in, in, in this case. So on December 4th of 2017, her body was found. And this is what I don't understand, Danielle. Her, so it, there were 13 pieces of her body in separate locations around the county in this area of Clay County, Nebraska. They were wrapped in plastic trash bags and dumped in ditches along gravel roads. And the way they initially finally identified that it was her was through a tattoo. Mm -hmm. So here's the other part I'm having some trouble I, with. I know what you're going to say. The prosecutor said that none of her organs were found when they did the autopsy. Absolutely missing from her remains were all of her organs. That's like, that's really sick. It's a lot. 
and I know we'll talk about it, but there was the the anatomy <sighs> book that was also found, which will certainly be evidence the prosecutor will use. Oh my goodness. So also found at the crime scene, a sex toy, a dog leash, wads of duct tape, plastic sheets that were smeared with blood. This is really bizarre. The sauna suit, you know, like one of those things to sweat in with the crotch cut out. And what's okay. So then let's get back to the, the date. The last time we know anyone saw Sydney alive. So she went out with Bailey Boswell, who went by the name of Audrey on Tinder. Boswell lives with a man who's named Aubrey Trail. Boswell and Trail were seen at the Home Depot hours before that time period in which Sydney disappeared. Okay. They were seen purchasing the following items. A hacksaw. Tin snips. What do you do with those? A utility knife, drop cloths, and here's something else that's so bizarre. On that same day that they went to Home Depot, they, um, the, the, it, this would be like the boyfriend, all right? Does a, does a walk by, right? Does a drive by. Of where, of where um, Sydney mm -hmm. lives. It works, excuse me, works. I, it, it's sounding a little premeditated here, obviously. And then they go through the phone records um, and they start finding a lot of weird, weird stuff going on. So they get a search warrant for the apartment that Trail and Boswell live in. Okay, right? This is the couple. Um, and it seems like this couple just lured poor Sydney out for a very disturbing, oh my Lord, what they did to her as part of like what they said was a play acting of a movie that turns out to be a snuff film. It's, where do I go with this, Danielle? Unsurprisingly, it's a basement apartment, <laughs> which you can't make up. Um, but, I, you know, I have to say, I, I do love the way that you're talking about this and the way that the news articles are, because there's absolutely no shaming of the victim, right? There's no, because people, adults can engage in consensual, consensual sex, right? And, and sort of whatever kinks they want. This is not that. This is someone who was taken advantage of and who was a victim. So I think... At the very least, we can step back and be thankful that we're living in a time where there's no victim blaming here and where we can really look at this and say this this was not this was not that, right? If people, if adults want to use Tinder and want to live their life, great, go for it. This obviously is not that. Right. And what we'll never know is to what degree Sydney wanted to participate in this kind of a sexual experience. To what degree did she go along with it? Um, and at what point did it turn from a consensual sexual experience into and then to murder? Right. Mm -hmm. And the defense, the boyfriend and the girlfriend, right, who lured Sydney, th their defense has kind of been, hey, um, things got a little out of hand and she wasn't supposed to die and that's what happened and we're really sorry and that shouldn't have happened. So I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. There were a few things that I think people might be interested in from the other side. Why is this happening this way, right? So criminal defense attorneys cannot decide whether or not our clients will testify. It is absolutely up to the client. So that's a constitutional right that they're guaranteed. I can say, please, please, please don't. I'll, I'll even tell you a little, a little detour. When I was a public defender in Manhattan, I had a client accused of indecent exposure and, 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 and lewd, basically lewd acts in public. And I was a baby lawyer and it was just a bench trial. And the young police officer, also a new officer, was too shy. So I kept asking him about my client's penis. Because he had to testify that. They had to establish that it was exposed and that he was acting in a sexual way. And he, would, he couldn't say, he couldn't talk about it. So I knew I was going to win because they need to prove the case. 
And at least in my head, the judge says to me, you know, okay, the prosecution rested. Are you going to rest counsel? In other words, don't, don't stop snatch, while you're ahead. <laughs> correct. Don't snatch a, what do they say? Defeat from the jaws of victory. Uh, so I turned to my client and I said, sir, I truly believe we're going to win. Please do not testify. It is your right. Uh, you may, please do not testify. He insisted on testifying and walked up to the stand and his pants dropped. And we all saw what the police officer was too scared to testify about. Uh, I will say in the end, um, that wasn't enough. We, we, I still got a not guilty on that one. But in this case, I'll bring it back, I promise. Uh, what uh, Aubrey, right, the, the boyfriend, his defense might just be something that he thought of. And his lawyer, we don't know, might be sitting there saying, please don't do this. Please don't say this. But it's absolutely up to him. And sometimes uh, when we do have you know, appointed clients, we want to do the best that we can, but there are some clients who won't talk to us. So that's why trials are the most exciting thing in the world, because this might have been a surprise to the defense team also. Because you never know when someone's going to drop their pants. It, correct. Correct. Okay. And, and that was quite an experience, I bet. It really You was. know what? And clearly your client had a thing where he needed attention. That's why he was doing what he was doing. Hello. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> Let's get back to this case. Acquitted. That, <laughs> acquitted. <laughs> You're an excellent attorney, clearly. <laughs> um, so when the police go to search the apartment of where the couple lived, they said that the, the landlord explained to the police, it's like, you know, there's been a really strong smell of bleach the last few days. Ding, 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 red flag. Investigators then found the hatchet, um, a package for that sauna suit, as well as cameras, zip ties, and they found a book called The Human Body Atlas. Now, ordinarily, that book is not so bizarre, but it is bizarre if if the victim's organs are missing and why they'd be missing. It's definitely so, on the list of things that you don't want found at your murder client's house. Okay. But of all the things that were found, that seems to be like the least, um, you know, that would implicate, but nonetheless, yes, it, it does tell a story that there's a, there's a picture that's building here. Then data from Boswell's two cell phones showed that she drove 200 miles back and forth to where the remains were all found, right? Remember mm -hmm. that Sydney's remains were found all over the place. So then this is when we start getting the story about what may have happened. So Trail claims that Sydney was accidentally killed when they were filming a, conse a consensual sex fantasy and that she was strangled to death. And that's what really happened. And if that's what really happened, I don't think you had to go to all the crazy lengths of chopping her up and putting her all over the place unless you really thought that they'd never find her and that they'd never identify her. Right? Sometimes it's not the, the best defense, but it's certainly what, what he's going with. But I, I think he did say, um, and I'm not saying this was the best way to go, but I think he did say, you know, I was afraid that no one would believe me. And didn't he tell yes. me if I'm wrong? Didn't he plead guilty to a lesser yes. crime? Um, yes. So it's weird. So in June of 2019, he pleaded guilty to improper disposal of Sydney's remains, but not guilty to murder or conspiracy. So, you know, the prosecutors are saying there's a whole, so that's, so he's saying, oh, it was an accident. I'm making a movie. Yeah. Um, I didn't mean to kill her because, you know, she just died. So really, yes. Did I bury her body parts? Yes. Right. I'm, I'm, I, I will tell you in the court that that's what I did. I did that. But prosecutors are saying, no, 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 no. That is not really what happened. They're arguing that he had planned for weeks to lure a woman via social media to try and kill. Now they're saying social media. I think it's funny. Sometimes prosecutors, depending on their age, think what they meant were dating apps. But OK. Um, or, you know, it's possible that they were, you know, profiling her already through her social media. That's also possible. You know, he does admit that he choked Sydney with an extension cord as part of this um, sex movie that they were making. 
Now, during this murder trial, the defendant ends up suffering two heart attacks, two heart attacks and a stroke. As if there isn't enough drama going on here, right? There's like another side story going on. And then then something really bizarre happens. Uh, On June 28th, while in court, Trail suddenly speaks up and says, Bailey, that would be his girlfriend, is innocent. I curse you all. And then he slashes his neck a few times with either a sharp pen or maybe a piece of a razor blade. It was enough that he needed some stitches. It was more dramatic. It didn't really, it didn't really, you know, seriously injure himself. And it sure as heck didn't stop the proceedings in court. Ultimately, they bandaged him up and got him back in there. I'm going. Yeah. All right. So three weeks of really grisly testimony, viewing 500 pieces of evidence. The jury took less than three hours to come back with a verdict. He was found guilty. Trail was found guilty of both first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder in the slaying and dismemberment of Sidney Loof. But we're not done. We're not done. That's that's just one part, right? So so now. There is um, a current case, right? Because remember, so that's the guy involved in the murder, right? Charged with murder. And now his girlfriend, the one who met up with Sydney, her trial has now started. Okay, this is Boswell's trial. For all of you trying to keep up with all these names, I know it's really hard. So she's been charged with first degree murder as well. And her trial began September 21st, just last month. And during the ninth day of the trial, an FBI forensic expert took the stand and has brought in 155 pieces of evidence. So now what's coming out while this is still going on, a lot of the DNA evidence is now coming out and we're getting some information, which is really interesting because there are apparently 17 crime scenes because that's where all her body parts were were dumped and buried. And they have now found, they found at the scene like things like latex gloves and and all all of this. And it's matching back to Sydney. So all this DNA evidence that's just been entered just in the last few weeks is coming back as being connected to the murder. I just it's almost as if the case is actually growing. Like, it feels like there's even more evidence than there was for the first trial for the other defendant. So sometimes time is on the side of the accused because it can lead to a more fair trial and other times only more evidence uh, can be introduced. I I did want to mention it's interesting that they're tried separately. And what I'm thinking about is what is Boswell's defense going to be? So the law allows for defense attorneys to move for separate trials. The case is called Bruton. Really, it means when a co-defendant's confession implicates the other defendant, they can't get a fair trial, right? So let's say you and I are charged with a crime and I confess, I say, I did it, but Anna did too. Well, that's not fair that what I said would be used against you. So in this case, it leaves Boswell completely open to do whatever defense she might, right? She might go a completely different direction. Certainly, there's not a question that she was there. I don't think they can do an identity defense. But tell me if you've seen, I haven't seen which way her lawyers are going to go yet. I think they're still going through just the enormous amount of evidence that the government is bringing right now. Yes, the prosecutors are now presenting their case. So, We'll be waiting to hear what the defense is. What's also interesting, you mentioned that they were indeed, yes, they've, one has already been tried, the other one has her court hearing. What happened in the middle of all of this, because, you know, the first one was a circus, the boyfriend's circus trial. They've been trying to get coded messages to each other uh-huh. so they could come up with the same story when each came up for trial. Okay, now you really don't think Anybody's going to pick up on that. I wish that we could read those letters. Oh, yeah. I'm sure they, because their code is probably so crazy that that's probably what caught everyone's attention, right? As the people at the jail are reading this, they're like, 
this letter makes absolutely no sense. It's completely incoherent. Ah, because it's a code. (laughs) Yep. There must be something to it. Yeah. So we're going to keep you updated on this case. We know it's very complicated, but at the end of the day, a woman was murdered because she met someone on a dating app and she just wanted to do what it is that she wanted to do. And what they wanted was not what she had in mind. So let's hope there's justice. Certainly, I'm looking forward to seeing what um, Boswell's defense attorneys bring forward here. And of course, for the family of this young woman to have this be over and get to, to uh, as best as they can, given this horrifying situation, have some sense of an ending here. And I think that's what's really hard about what happened to Sydney, because not only do you have to find out what happened to your daughter and identify her through a tattoo because her body parts are scattered all over a county. But then you have to start hearing the, the lunacy coming out of, of the you know, people who are charged with murdering her. And then the antics in the courtroom with the standing up and the you know, slashing and the every and then the heart attacks and the stroke. I mean, there's a lot going on there. And this family's just trying to get justice. And you've got a whole set of things that most people are not prepared to deal with. I, I undoubtedly, I think very none of us are prepared to deal with that kind of loss and then to have to hear about how it happened and then for it never to be to feel like it's not closing, right? To feel like we can't at least bury her and and move on is must be torturous. Yeah, it really is. Okay, we'll keep you posted on that one. So it's time for our comments section. These are the crimes you all are talking about. Actor Rick Moranis was punched in the head and knocked to the ground last week in this unprovoked attack that happened on Manhattan's Upper West Side. Now, he's the actor from Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and my favorite little shop of horrors, this That's absolutely one of my favorites. Police confirm that the 67-year-old actor, I had no idea he was 67 years old. That's the other headline here. It's like, what? He's eternally 34 in my head. Of course. Uh, Right? Yeah. Um, That the 67-year-old actor was walking south on Central Park West near 70th Street. Now, for those of you who don't know, that is about the nicest neighborhood and safest neighborhood you could be walking in, in Manhattan. It really is. And out of nowhere, this man comes up on him and with a closed fist attacks him. It happened at quarter to eight in the morning and and Rick Moranis goes down. So he is, he hits his head really hard. He hurts his back, his right hip. He does go to the hospital and he also goes to police to make this complaint. Surveillance images were found of the person who they believe attacked Rick Moranis, and they have these images of the man who's showing this, like, dark, he's wearing this this kind of New York hoodie, mm-hmm. but the sweatshirt says, I love New York with the heart in the middle. It's, oh. All right. These are the comments. Lala F. writes, this is exactly like kicking a puppy. I will go to jail for Rick Moranis. Tamika P. writes, Anybody but this guy who wants to hurt honey, I shrunk the kids. Totally agrees. Like he seems like the nicest guy ever, right? Absolutely. And Ka- and Kayla R writes, he sh- he should have shrunk him. But the good thing is he's going to be okay, and hopefully there'll be an arrest. But that is really scary when when there's the randomness of crime. That's when everybody freaks out when it's random. It's not like you know when a family member kills, right? kills a family member, it's like when it's random, it's like, oh my God, this could happen to me. I, absolutely. Absolutely. That is what is, what's the scariest. And most crime is, is known victim. So this kind of random situation is, it's scary. Mm-hmm. And there's, and we still have no idea whether that person knew who he was attacking. Like when he attacked Rick Moranis, was it because he recognized him or it was just, he was there and the other guy was pissed and was going to do what he was going to do? Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Our next case in the comments section. All right. We're in California now. A martial arts expert fought off an intruder who entered into the apartment of an 82-year-old neighbor. Okay. So it's like this intruder goes into two apartments, messed with the wrong woman without question. This happened in Fontana. So the 
intruder went into Lorenza Maruja's apartment. She goes by the name of Miss Kitty, so we're going to go with Miss Kitty because it, it, this works its way into the, into the case here. So when he breaks into Miss Kitty's apartment, she pulls out a baseball bat, and she's not playing around, and she is a martial arts expert. So she's quoted as saying, I was aiming at his head, and then he backed off, and then he said this, which is so weird. I wonder if he knew her. Sure, yep. He said, he said, no, Miss Kitty. No, Miss Kitty. I'm not going to hurt you. Now, how's he going to know that that's Miss Kitty unless she introduced herself with the baseball bat and said, this is Miss Kitty? Possible. Well, given some of the um, things that happened, I would not doubt that she introduced herself as Miss Kitty with her baseball bat. And, and uh, let me tell you what I'm going to do there, buddy. So, um, <laughs> Miss Kitty says to him, quote, and I said, get the F out of my apartment right now, which he did, which was a smart move. However, lunatic intruder then goes to another unit, but in there is an 82-year-old woman. Her name is Elizabeth McRae, and she's found on the ground. He jumped on her, and he started beating her. Well, you know Miss Kitty was not far away, okay? She hears the neighbor screaming for help, and so um, the intruder, he had turned the lights off so you couldn't see where he was, but that did not stop Miss Kitty. No. What did Miss Kitty do? She got him on the ground. I love this woman. <laughs> and then she goes on to say, first I went down onto his chest, you know, and then she's demonstrating what she's doing, and, and then... Um, you know, I guess she put the bat on his throat and then she had her hand on his jaw. And I mean, she just had. Yeah, she got him. She got him. Miss Kitty's a hero. Oh, she's amazing. Now, the Fontana Police Department says they do not recommend that anyone who is a victim of a home invasion ever react this way. However, however. They are impressed with Miss Kitty's skills, okay? There's no disputing that this one ended up okay. And, um, yeah, she's a badass, Miss Kitty. And apparently that's a lot of the comments we have here. Teresa T., girl power. She is an Aries, full of fire. She is woman. Hear her roar. Minnie D. writes, someone buy her a cape. She has an invisible cape. And then Stephanie C. writes, you go, Miss Kitty. That's what I'm talking about with plenty of exclamation points. She's really something, that Miss Kitty. I'm glad that we're ending on that note because I have to say that this week's cases were really, really dark and heavy. So it makes me feel a little bit better and have a little bit of hope in humanity, right? Absolutely. I tell my clients that we have to laugh because if we don't laugh, we'll just cry. So I, yes. I love that, that end story. And I think it's important to, to look at the good in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's our show for this week. Danielle, where can people find you if either they they need such an optimistic defense attorney <laughs> or they just want to follow you on social media? So I have an Instagram. It's at Iredale Law. Iredale is I-R-E-D-A-L-E-L-A-W. I have a website, Law Offices of Danielle Iredale. And thank you so much for having me on. I, I really enjoyed today. Oh, I, I always love having you on. You're just, you're, you're a breath of fresh air. And I do love your optimism when it comes to humanity, even in the darkest of times. And I think we all need a little bit of that sunshine. You can find me on all social media platforms at Anna G News. That's Anna with one N. I don't, you know, post a lot about crime. It's mostly about chihuahuas and the birds at my feeder and the birds in the fountain, because you know what? I need a break from the craziness of this world. But I also want to remind everyone that I do read your comments, especially on YouTube. And uh, last week, I love this comment. A, a woman said, oh, I'm so excited. Every Friday when the podcast comes out, that's when I do all my knitting. I just knit and listen to you. And I'm like, I love that. That is so cool. So, um, yeah, I, I do read your comments and I try to respond and always love to hear what you think of a case, sometimes you have amazing points of view. So as always, you can find our content on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, you can watch us on YouTube on our channel. You can get updates by subscribing to our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. 
Until next week, this is True Crime Daily, the podcast. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, don't do crime. <laughs>